bug you about or gr- what are grievances that you have against Christians against me well voting you know you're going to vote the you know for okay what Texas else stem cell. Um, there are so many things that I see that Christians as a whole do uh, there's physical behavior physical harm meaning that there are Christians that withdraw medical treatment because their authoritative figures tell them that, to pray most Christians don't. And this yeah, is not be, just Christian scientists. Either. Be limited are, sex. Well, uh, S-E-C-T-S. It, yes, it goes all over, <laughs> not just limited to Christian scientists, which is a sex, a sec, a S-E-C-T, correct. Uh, financial harm, you know, we talked about this before. You get a housing allowance. If I worked as a basketball coach for you, i get a housing allowance. And where is that coming from? It's coming from your pocket. That doesn't have anything to do with religion. Faith-based initiative coming from all of our pockets. Is that a government state thing that's going on there? First Amendment, you know, wall of separation? Mm-hmm. Well, just time out. What he's talking about with housing allowance is that as a pastor, I'm allowed under the rules of the IRS to take a percentage of my, uh, whatever I, my rent is for my house or something, and be tax free on that. Although I do pay taxes. <laughs> you guys is faces like you're like who cares <laughs> uh, yeah i want to become a minister but, no but your your face uh, but but that i have tax with social security on that but i'm tax free as far as the federal tax so that's what he's mentioning by the housing yeah. line. and it's interesting because that's something we've been talking at starbucks and that's something that like i'm actually wrestling with right now i was like that's something i should do as a pastor because it was built like in the 30s and 40s yeah. when um mm-hmm. you know the the pastor lived on a parsonage that was attached to the church and that's not the case now. We don't have any houses here at Calvary Church that I know of um, that are here. So is that still a, 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 a thing of integrity? And so that's something that, and I appreciate yeah. you bringing that up because that's something that I've been yeah. even personally wrestling with. Oh, good for you. Lab, although I did have to pay a lot of taxes this year, as I told ah, you. That's right. Um, but okay. Well, also psychological harm uh, for kids growing up saying they're going to go to hell. What type of uh, you know harm is that? And finding intellectual harm. Uh, that would be the harm caused by, let's just say, one of the many creationist movements that evolution doesn't exist it's a false it's a false uh, it's a it's a myth are we dumbing down our students with science it's been proven that kids that are taught why is the sky blue because god says it's blue or instead of saying oh well let's figure it out and go to a prism and see the different colors separate it's been proven that those kids have have less imagination if they're just told god did it and I, alex is not here but he actually knows the study by the way anything that i say tonight you could say, prove it, please, and I'll be happy to give you a, my website and directions to where uh, the particular study has been done. And some of these are multiple studies. Don't believe one study. You have to go through multiple studies. Well, I, I know Bruce has more, <laughs> I, I guess, that he would say that frustrates him or is a grievance against yeah. Christianity. We, we'll kind of move on from there. Yeah, let's do um, Still but, and that's something that we've been dialoguing about, talking well, about. What's, but what's your grievance with that? atheism? Do you have any? Uh, you I'll think we're just mad atheists trying to change the world? Or? I'll, I'll get to that in my oh, little portion. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in that. Um, what are your thoughts about Jesus, the person of Jesus? That's a question. That's a great question because Jesus is so dear to the hearts of Christians and Catholics. <clears throat> I believe that there might have been a person named Jesus. At that particular time, there's probably thousands of people named Jesus. Probably tens or t- hundreds of them might have even had a religion different than Christianity. Do I believe Jesus ever existed? After the big one, in this book, Sons of God, as well as other books, all of the Christian myths come from previous gods, previous traditions, previous cultures. That's what really did it for me. For me, uh, some atheists would say, well, he could have been a guy, and he could have just been preaching, but, and I, I still believe that, but he didn't do, I don't think he did any miracles, because even the chronological, um, the chronological history of the Gospels shows that the miracles start getting bigger as time progresses. A very common legend-making procedure among people who rewrite history. And there is not one that I found, and I challenge all Christians, this is my big Christian challenge, is give me one attribute of Jesus, just one that is original, that is not taken off the pagan theologies not taken up from Egyptians, not taken from the Greeks. Give me one attribute, death, resurrection, virgin birth, which is questionable on the virgin word as Greek and Greek. 
And um, just give me one. And so far, I have come up with nothing. I've asked that question for 10 years now. So it's well, it's interesting, at least from my perspective, uh, as you know, the royal wedding was on two weeks ago. My mm -hmm. wife watched it. I didn't watch any of it. Um, <laughs> okay, I watched a little bit of it. And uh, it was so interesting. I was reading some of the backstory of William and Kate and how she was a, a what do you call it, um, commoner. Mm -hmm. And William obviously was prince, you know, has a, has a the, the line to the throne. Mm -hmm. And they're saying how the William's family and Kate's family were having some awkward interactions because it was royalty coming that's right. Against commoners, and there's just some awkwardness about that. If you look at, I think, the queen, I think you should, she's awkward in general. <laughs> but, um, but they were just, just talking about how there was this you know, mixing of things. What I believe is so beautiful about Jesus is that I believe if he was God, he was king, he came into this world, and it says something incredibly beautiful. It says that he came into the world not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And as I look at that, I think, wow, that's unlike any other king who demands that we serve him. Jesus came into this world to serve us. And so I think that would be a unique attribute of That comes God. pretty close. That's a good one. Very good, man. Touche. <laughs> You're not being hard enough. Come on. What well, else you got? I don't know about that particular God that has that attribute. That's the one attribute, I think. Now, wait a second here. We're talking about the Son of God, and he has one little attribute that's original meaning forgiveness of sin would that be it shouldn't it be a little heftier give me some muscle there you know that type of thing but i'm sure that there might be uh, that's a good question i'm open to all answers and i'll research and get back to you as i don't make any decisions until i compare and decide question eight we're gonna have 10 questions for bruce tonight but uh question eight is do public expressions of religion bother you and if so why no nope. that's it public expressions meaning can you give me an example and i'll tell you about it yeah but i think i, I know what you're where you're headed well probably uh, there are a couple ways to say it, we're, we're public right now i mean anyone could walk in no, it doesn't and, bother me and do that mm -hmm. maybe what i mean in that question is public as far as the city of villa park having a religious expression is <laughs> Is that bother you, and if so, yes, why? Yes, church and state separation, that's, that's a sticking point. I think that one of the reasons, I think you, can, you, you guys are kind of getting it both ways here, you know? You have the separation of church and state by our founding fathers meant that anybody of one person can actually be their own religion. Look at all the other countries that have one religion, England, Germany, you know, Egypt, any of the Muslim countries. They have one official religion. In the U.S., you're open to any religion any belief of conscience that you like to have. That's why you have Calvary Church. Instead of one Catholic, a Catholic church on every street corner, there's 36,000 Christian sects. I think it's up now. I mean, some of them don't agree with one another as well. And the way of their own tenets actually uh, are contradictory with other tenets. Jesus, of course, is a commonality. So public display when you're saying uh, you're the public square. Yes, the church and a lot of uh, religionists think this way too. The church and state should remain separate because that's the only way the church keeps its power. Just think if there was only one church allowed. Let's say that the government was taken over by a church. Which church would it be? The Reconstructionists want the whole con Constitution completely declared void and put Jesus in the Bible in its place. What church is it going to be? That would be probably a bigger storm than the Civil War because all the churches would be fighting. Mm -hmm. So yes, I believe in the strict church-state separation. I believe it's healthy for both sides. Mm -hmm. I believe that, uh, that we should not, we should have more of a church-state separation. And over the last 90 years, Congress, every 10 years or so, gets persuaded by groups like the, um, the Knights of Columbus. Columbus. Knights of Columbus drafts a bill that makes it easier for religionists to live and harder for the rest of us to live. And freedom of, uh, freedom, Siege of Freedom is uh, Madeleine O'Hara's book. And I uh, would like Bringing to- Bringing up Madeleine O'Hara. Yeah, Madeleine O'Hara, the most evil huh. woman in America. <laughs> but her book's good, and it's very honest because you can go through, it's a history of how religionists actually take over power and get money from the rest of us. Hmm. And just not about Christianity. It's actually the Catholics went in and the Protestants actually <laughs> 
<laughs> protested because they wanted in too. Hmm. So the Catholic, Catholics said, okay, we'll make this law for all religions. Yeah. And this happens consistently every decade or yeah. so. Okay, question nine is this. So that, that would be a yes in, in that particular And this one, this is one that we as Christians often, I think, dialogue with skeptics and with, with those that are agnostic or, or atheists. And, and, I, and I think sometimes we put you in an unfair position when we say this because when we ask this question, we're basically maybe making a statement that <laughs> you don't have any morals. And, uh, and for me asking this question, and we've, we almost, every time we talk at Starbucks, we almost bring up this type of topic. And for me, making this statement, I'm not suggesting that you don't have morals. I've, I've watched you stop at stop signs. I know <laughs> that, that you do that. I haven't killed any children yeah. lately, that's true. Yeah. So, so please, and then I guess maybe I just even, <laughs> so I don't mean to be starting my part now, but as, as skeptics or as atheists, when a Christian asks you this question, I hope that there's, I hope they're asking it in a way that's not a double <laughs> meaning with that, like you have no morals. Mm -hmm. But, but I think it's a genuine question of, okay, what is your standard? Where do we get our morals yeah, from? Yeah, yeah. Where do we get our morals from, and what standard do we do perceive, or to, to have good morals? And I'm going to just throw it out just for a couple. Does any skeptics, atheists, want to answer that really quickly? You know. Bible, and so we all pick and choose. We all look around and we decide what's best for us and pick and choose from it. Anybody else? Yes? Yeah, I think it's socialization. It's changed even in the last hundred years what's acceptable, like, you know. Culturally. Yeah, culturally, as far as like animal abuse and stuff like that. That's changed significantly the way women are treated. All of this, our, our whole moral code as society is changing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at things like how many people in here need shrimp, Okay, that's an abomination in the Bible. So I'm just saying, even we think that so you're a cultural relativist, and we think, oh, well, God has grown up. But if you were talking about a fixed moral code, mm -hmm. Christians have evolved as well. Christians have evolved as well. The whole society is evolving. That's my So you're a cultural relativist, <laughs> meaning right. that you're based your morals on cultures, no, different around the world. Yeah. Flyer down there for a dance. <laughs> <laughs> Back when I was a youngster. <laughs> oh yeah. Church of the Nazarene. I grew up partly in that. Yeah. If you had put a dance flyer in that church, they would take you out back and home. Strike down. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's Satan himself. So another moral relative for this yeah, here. That's up to morals. So do you? There's significant portions of Christians that think it's perfectly good to have a dance. Mm -hmm. So, as a dance moral was the, the question in certain circumstances, no. I think I, I'm just going to stop right there because we're going to continue on. But I think that questions from the Christians would be good about morality. Uh, morality is actually from three things. And I actually going to stroke myself here. I'm, this is something that I thought about that I haven't read in any of these books. It comes from our upbringing. It's, that's pretty obvious. It comes from biology, evolution. We see morality in apes and chimpanzees. Studies have shown that they have morals. They don't kill each other. And in rare circumstances, chimps do. Uh, rats actually don't eat when they're eating causes another rat to be electrocuted. And they very quickly learn that. I mean, a rat's nihilistic. Nihilistic means the world is for you. You can do anything you want. You, most people think rats don't have any morals. Same thing with mice. They'll stop eating nearly until they starve if their animal friend gets harmed. You think that they were taught that? No, it comes from upbringing, it comes from evolution, and the most important part is peers. Yeah, let me push back a little bit on that. The upbringing is not teaching. Uh, you, it is you teaching, You use the word yes. upbringing, but That's you say right. they're not taught that. And that, that doesn't that. actually do it. We talked about Jeffrey Dahmer. He lived in a great you know, household and, right. you know, but Something and I, I, some people don't even think it's a mental disease because a mental disease is considered chemically based. What if it's neurology based? What if it's just your brain wired that way? You're born that way. Doesn't matter evolution. Doesn't matter culture. Doesn't matter teaching. Doesn't matter peers. You're just gonna be turning out bad. And this is where science comes in because eventually 
we're going to know with the brain scan, if it becomes cheap enough, whether or not you're going to be more moral or less moral. I know this sounds like science fiction, but some scientists that are neurologists that are much smarter than anyone in this room in neurology is going to know. Then basically they, they say there will come a time where we will know our morality, our morality level, so to speak, at an early age, and we're going to be hardwired for that. Let me stop you right there. It's a huge question. I'm going to ask yeah. one more huge question, but I'm going to ask you to kind of condense it. And I don't okay. mean to be unfair Sorry. with that, but just through time's sake. Uh, another little tiny question here is, uh, why do you have such an issue with God's benevolence, which is his goodness? Why is God's benevolence or lack of benevolence such a sticking point to your unbelief in God? And I've kind of affectionately, and I've kind of poked at you at this, but I've called you um, an emotional atheist on this because you have such an issue with God's goodness. Like, oh, it's... He needs to be good, and I feel like that's kind of an emotional appeal, okay. and so I'm wondering what, how you would answer Let's that. Let's put it this way. Uh, your God was invented in a tribe of people called Israelites, and all the other people around the Israelites are killed, murdered, kids murdered, dashed against the stones. I think that's, um, I forget the verse. Excuse me, it's one of my favorite verses, too. Uh, and Mennonites get killed all for the Israelites. Israelites can do no harm. Canaanites, them too. In fact, they were circumcised either before or after they killed 200 of them. You know about that. Philistines, excuse me, not, not Canaanites, Philistines. If you have a Bible or any word of a divine nature and you see so many contradictions in it, how can you believe that God is benevolent? It's, it's very difficult for me to, wait, wait, to believe that right God there. is benevolent. Am I answering the right question? Yeah, you are. You are. But okay. I just want to make sure that we're clear on where you're going with that. So you're saying that you see these and what you're calling bad things that God does, and you feel like that's a contradiction because yeah. what you're not saying is that you also say the Bible believes that God is good, right? Well, partly good, yeah. But, uh, and uh, did the, I should have brought the Jefferson's Bible out here. Are you, are you familiar with the Jefferson's Bible? Uh, for not uh, for those not uh, that don't know about the Jefferson Bible, uh, he took out all the bad parts and all the mythical superstition parts. And they, you know how many pages were left? Anybody know? 88. 88 pages. And you can buy the Jefferson Bible now. That's, that's our president, by the way, third president of the U.S. If you can imagine any president now <laughs> taking the Bible yeah, and ripping pages Jefferson out. Jefferson was a deist, which means yes, he, was, yes. uh, he believed, believed in the, the, the watchmaker god. god that, or uh, I guess that's how god. you say it, yeah. Set the God, set the world motion, and then right. walk away. But yeah, I've, I have a big thing with benevolency, as well as omniscience and um, omnipotency. Because to me, that's not a rational belief; that's an emotional belief. No, it's coming right out of your Bible, pretty much. That's it's pretty hard to because for me, and we've talked about this a lot, but it it's feels emotional like, it reaction. It feels like you're saying that's just not right. I don't like that. When people kill other people because of authority figures. Yeah, that's not benevolent. When God kills seven or 532,852, and yes, somebody actually did count it up, without any human intervention at all, just God, how many did the devil kill? Anybody know? What? Seven. Seven. Now, I'm not going for the devil if there is one, but I'm going to question why somebody met, you know, murdered 500 on his own volition. Well, John, John 10 talks about Satan comes to seek, kill, and destroy. So that's his nature is to do that. Right. I totally agree with you there. <laughs> I don't know if you want to start comparing numbers with that. <laughs> Let me stop you right there. Yeah. You've done a great job. Hasn't Bruce, I feel like he's articulated himself. and um, It's not easy. Uh, I appreciate your guys' attendance. Mm. Will you take a 30 seconds and just stretch for a minute? And, um, and then let me try to, mm. in, my, in my best way, in just a few minutes, explain a few things that I hope that skeptics will hear from me as a Christian. So we just stretch for 30 seconds and then I'll call you back. All right, thanks you guys. I just want to respect our time so um, sorry for the strictness. <laughs> if you need to get up and leave, you can at any time. But um, I'll have a, I'll stick around afterward for questions. Yeah. And also, 
if you have any questions that if I'm busy, just ask any uh, you know any horn filled uh, atheist over here. You know, just look for the horns and you'll find them. That actually yeah. segues perfectly what I want to say. <laughs> Great. Uh, 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 helping atheists understand Christians. Now, uh, like I said from the top, um, I. I speak from my heart on this and what I know. I'm probably not the best person to explain it, but I hope that you can understand just even some of the things I'm about to share. But uh, as, uh, here's the first thing I want you to understand. As Christians, we don't hate atheists. <laughs> can, you, can you understand that? Can you please hear that tonight? That we do not hate atheists as Christians or wish for their demise. When you aren't here next Tuesday, we're not going to have a prayer meeting wishing for your demise. Can you, I kind of say that jokingly, but I'm, I'm really serious about that. Uh, that's, that's not what we're called to be as Christians. In fact, Jesus commands us to love our neighbors. And you know I'm a pastor, so I'm going to open my Bible. <laughs> but uh, in, in the book of Luke, I saw it. <laughs> in the book of Luke, there's this incredible passage where Jesus gives a parable, and he talks about the Good Samaritan. Maybe you're familiar with that, even if you're a skeptic and you, you've studied the Gospels. And, and in that, he describes this really amazing scene where uh, there's a man who is an enemy of the Jewish people. He is from a culture and a people group that hates the Jews, and the Jews hate him and his culture. And Jesus tells this story, and in the story, he has the Jewish priest walk by. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. The hated one gets beat up by a group of robbers and thrown to the side of the road to die. And then in the story, Jesus tells that there's a priest, a Jewish priest, who walks past him and ignores him. He's too busy. Then he tells about another religious man who walks past this this dying man, this man that they think probably is dead, and he walks past him. Um, and then, and sorry, I missed up on the story, but and then uh, this guy walks by, and this guy's bloody and, and left for dying. And it's not him that was beat beat up, the the enemy, but the enemy that walks by the ro- the beat up man stops and says, "I'm going to help this guy." And so it's the arch enemy of the Jews is the one who stops and cares for this beaten up man. And then the story goes on that he takes care of him and and brings him into town and cleans him up and pays for him to be rehabilitated. And then Jesus looks at the, the religious leaders who are hearing this parable and he says, well, who is the neighbor in that story? And the religious leaders are stuck in this moment because it's the bad guy who is the hero in the story. And the, Jesus says, go and do likewise. Just like this guy, this, this bad guy who I'm now making the hero of this story. And so he flips things right there. And then later on or in Matthew, Jesus says, that you've, been, you've heard that you're supposed to love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I'm telling you, you're called to love your enemies. And this is Jesus' words in, in the Gospel of Matthew. And so if you ever have a Christian who says, I hate you because you're an atheist or a skeptic, then I believe they're not being faithful to what Jesus taught and what he's called his followers to be about. And so the first thing I want you to understand and hear tonight is that we do not hate you. I do not hate you. I do not wish for your demise. Um, and so I, please, I, just, I want you to hear that tonight. Jesus calls all of us to love our enemies. The second thing is this. We respect your courage to stand up for what you believe, even if you feel like you're in the minority. And ironically, devoted Christians also feel like the minority in our society and also need courage to stand up for what we believe. And so, Bruce, if I can make this personal, I respect that (laughs) you're willing to stand up when it's not easy for something that you truly believe in you have the courage to do that. You have the courage to go on KTLA News and say, I'm Bruce, Gleason. I'm Bruce Gleason. Uh, I'm an atheist. I'm proud of this billboard, or I'm proud of what it stands for. I'm, I'm representing uh, my belief. And, and I respect you for that. I want you to know that, that that's not an easy thing to do. And I also want you Can and Can I others, hug you now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll just shake. <laughs> no. uh, 
but I also want skeptics to know that, that with this, that we as Christians often feel the same way. And I think this is something we have in common, that as devoted believers, we often feel like the minority. And you may kind of look at that and go, what are you, what are you talking about, Matt? Because you feel like the majority in our minds. But did you hear Bruce say earlier that 15% of our culture marks that they don't have a belief, right? Mm-hmm. Or they don't have Affiliation. a religion. Refi- yes, that's right. Correct. Now, the majority, or there's probably more than 50% would say that they're Christians, right? In our state, in our United States. <laughs> in oh, our yeah, United States. 75% right. are Christians. But what I'm talking about is not cultural Christianity, but I'm talking about like Bible believing, devoted Jesus followers. And I believe that that really is a minority in our culture. You can ask any Christian here how they feel at their school. Uh, at their place of employment, even their own families, you often feel like you're the only true, like solid, like serious follower of Jesus in your circle. And so in some ways we can relate to that feeling. In Iran, Christmas Day, there were 70 devoted Christians that were arrested um, on that day and thrown into prison. Several of them are still in prison today. Uh, In fact, I just got uh, an update on one of them that I'm following. And so we can relate to the idea of feeling like the minority in that way. So I I just want you to understand that uh, as atheists or as skeptics.